Okay, hi everybody. My name is Patrick Di Loreto, and uh, I'm working for William Hill. And today I'm going to talk to you about the actor, actor model. So I feel a little bit ashamed that I'm in a Lambda Congress, and I'm not going to talk essentially about monads. This conversation will be more around distributed systems. So I said, okay, I cannot talk about monads. At least I'm going to make my, I can propose to make my presentation monadic. So my thought was, considering the time, I can leave the presentation in the future and give you a promise and we can do parting and eventually <laughs> gonna complete successfully. Well, however, I have to ask uh, if Luis want to flat map his presentation and mine. Okay, these functional jokes apart, this presentation is gonna be about another way to design distributed system using a computational model known as actor model. Uh, just a quick question, how many of you are actually programming in Scala? Scala developers full time. How many of you ever used Akka? Wow, an Akka cluster? So that's fine, that's fine. So the one that uses Akka cluster, you're gonna feel some of these arguments are a little bit repetitive, but at least I hope you're gonna find something new. So what we are going to talk about, um, I want to give a little bit of motivation why we should be building distributed system today. So we're gonna look about the requirements of modern applications and possible implementation models of these applications. And the conversation will lead us now to reasoning about the concept of actor. And eventually we're gonna touch an argument about an aspect about vertical and horizontal scalability, the importance of both of them. Conclude the conversation around the ACA cluster. Just give a brief introduction about patterns that you can build on top of the clusters and leave the last minutes for questions. So requirements and model. When today you are asked to write an application that has to run on the internet, there is no way you can escape to these three requirements. Most of the time, every single application has to satisfy these three big questions. Your application has to be highly available. Your application has to scale and be fault tolerant. So what, what do we really mean when we talk about this? So highly availability. Today we develop applications that are on the internet and our customers want to find their applications and us providing service 24 hours per seven. It's not acceptable that you open your browser right now, you go to Google and rather than find the text box for search, you're gonna find a message saying, sorry, we are done for maintenance, come back in one hour. The world World Wide Web gonna fall, we're gonna have a bubble, Definitely Google will not be leader in the market. So we need to build actually systems that are highly available. Our customer will not accept that we don't, cannot serve them when they want. Scalability is all about think big. Yeah, how can Facebook serve all these customers? You know, at the end, internet is an open window to potential customers, which you potentially want to offer your server to all of them. And you don't want to have a constraint that doesn't allow you because you don't have enough resource to serve them. And full tolerance, to make it briefly but very effective, is shits happen, no matter what. Whenever and whatever, you're gonna have some problems and you need to be able to deal with that. So a bunch of people went and came back with a new brand word uh, called reactive manifesto. But in essence, they tried to capture those three requirements we have been seeing before and define them in a form of principle. So the idea is that those modern applications have to be responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven. So what does it really mean? Let, so let's start to talk about responsiveness. What is the responsiveness? And I think this sentence captured the meaning. Respond in a timely manner. So we said our applications are running on the internet. They have to be available. But actually, our users, are, people are using more and more mobile phones. And this kind of experience is much different than the one that you have at home with your computer. There is a context in which they are using the application. And the information you want to give, the service that you have to, be, to give to them, has to be effective, immediate. If you are on a taxi and you have to decide where to go to eat, you have to provide the response in a timely manner. So let's go and look at the resiliency and elasticity. And actually, those are two ways to describe how we can maintain responsiveness. So responsiveness is how successful we are. So the resilience essentially is stay responsive, respond in a timely manner in face of failures. So you need to design a system that can understand that sometimes 
somehow your system is going to have some problems. But you have to guarantee to be responsive. And this is an important concept because now we are bringing failure as part of the design. The one of you that programs in Java and in Scala knows that we model these things called exceptions. In the modern architecture, they shouldn't be called exceptions. They are not exceptional situations. They are part of the design. Elasticity is the orthogonal view. Stay responsive, respond in a timely manner, under different workloads. You have 10 customers, you have 10 million customers, no matter what, you have still to guarantee the same responsiveness. The last one is the message driven, and this is a little bit more how to achieve elasticity, resiliency, and responsiveness on a system. And actually, this is more a guideline how your system should be uh, implemented. And when we come to talk about message driven, most of the time people speak about, talk about distributed systems. So, Rather than say we need to implement a distributed system, let's define what is a distributed system. So what is a model for distributed computation? Well, we can identify at least three important properties. The first one is the concurrency. So it's a system that can have exec that execution can occur at the same time. We can process multiple things at the same time. The distribution, execution can occur at the same time in different locations, in different machines. And then we have the mobility. And the mobility is when the execution can move from one location to another. So let's start to explore a little bit more uh, these properties. And actually, let's get some computational models and see how the different computational models implement this concept. Uh, I don't have to spend too much time to describe the first one and the lambda calculus. So when we talk about lambda calculus and we use all our monads, we know the importance to have monads, they allow us to move the side effect and all the bad things outside the core of our software. At the very core, we're going to have pure functions. And we know that if we apply better reduction, no matter if we use call by name or call by value, lazy evaluation or eager evaluation, we're going to get the same result. And actually, some of these can be performed in parallel. And this is how the concurrency model can be implemented in pure functional style. Orthogonally opposite to this approach, there is the Van Neumann machines with the shared status, and now we need a total ordering to guarantee concurrency. And this is a tricky uh, situation because now you're introducing time as a dimension of your data. And this introduces lots of complexity. Now you have to deal with lock, mutex, and all these kind of amenities. Uh, 30 years, approximately 30 years after the Van Neumann machine, it came to another model, the actor model, which is a quite interesting one because it came from a totally different field. The initial idea was not to create a computational model, but it came from the field of artificial intelligence and actually those independent agents. The old idea behind the actors come from the artificial intelligence and the independent agents. Property of this model are share nothing, atomicity, information, and communication, uh, information through exchange of communications. So let's explore a little bit more what does it mean, what is an actor model. Let's explore what is an actor, and definitely not this kind of actor. So an actor is nothing else than a single unit of execution with a mailbox associated. So the actor can perform the operations, only the operations that are going to be delivered on his mailbox. When we use ACCA, an actor is nothing else than an implementation of the trade actor. And the logic and the semantic, how we should be processing the messages, is under the method receive. And now I'm going to show something that the purist of functional programming is going to dislike. What is a receive? It's a partial function from many to unit. It's very, very dirty. So it looks like dynamic programming like, uh, rather than type safe. However, there is a good news. Uh, apparently, since Akatsu.4, they are introducing an experimental API for typed actor. But this is another topic. So, we know that an actor processes the messages coming in the mailbox, but the other property, we say they should be able to communicate. So an actor communicates to another actor through message exchange. So if we have a sender actor, he's going to produce a new message delivered to the, ma to the mailbox of the simple uh, actor. The receive method is going to be called, and the pattern matching of the kind of message is going to be performed, and a response is going to be produced. So what we should remember about that? An actor embodies three elements, and this is really associated with the artificial intelligence field and the agents. Has the ability to perform processing, to perform business logic. 
the storage, it contains some variable and over the time acquired knowledge. And the last is the communications. So the only way the actor can tell a little bit about his internal status is just by exchanging messages. This gives us property like zero sharing. There is not a uh, shared area of memory. There is a concept of referential transparency. As long as you can talk to an actor, you don't need to know where the actor physically is. The model is intrinsically asynchronous, and this comes on the form of the mailbox and the message, how they are exchanged. And of course, we spoke about uh, storage, we spoke about variable, sounds a little bit dirty, but the mailbox guarantees us the linearization, which is the property we need to have uh, for concurrency when we have variables and shared method. So actors are unit of executions. They can talk by exchange messages. How do I build an application based on actors? So to build an application based on actor, you, ha you need to have an actor system, which is nothing else than a hierarchy of actor combined together. Every time you create an actor system, no matter what, you're going to have a root actor which is going to supervise every single actor that you're going to create in your system. So let's assume, given the background of my company, we want to build an application. And this application has to deal with bets, people are placing bets, and actually has to manage users' activity if they want to register, deposit, or whatever. So those two actors are created and are immediately associated as a child of a root user actor. The bat manager is in charge to handle all the bat requests that come into our system. So here is a request coming to the manager. And like in the real life, manager, they don't like to do the job. They will never do the job. The, the one thing they are very good at is delegate the job, you know? This bat placement is too risky. There are so many side effects that if I do it wrong, I can get fired. So what I do, I just hire some other actors there and I delegate the responsibility to this one. Apparently, it seems to be a good model because it can scale. Now I have a concurrently model process because mo more requests comes, more actors are gonna spawn and ask to do the job. When an actor completes his activity, he terminates, can terminate naturally, or eventually they're gonna fail. And here is where it comes the error kernel pattern where the manager now is in charge to handle with these problems. So every single actor has a property called supervisor strategy, which depending on the nature of the failure has to take an action. And the action is killing the actor, restarting your children actor, or eventually escalate to your parent. And this is a mechanism that allows to organize in a tree, way, uh, in a tree structure the, the failures. So if this actor cannot handle these specific situations, gonna delegate his parent to do that. The important aspect of this is that now we are introducing failure as part of the design. We want to design system that can fail. We want this element here to fail because it's the manager that's gonna decide what to do. We will never try to do a catch and implement some logic here. The other element is the isolation. The failure is, has to occur in isolation. If I fail here, it's not going to affect any other area of the system. So how do I play with actors? Not gonna spend much time on this. Uh, the code is quite trivial. Uh, you need to create an actor system. And once you have the actor system, you can use the actor for method to create an actor. You need to provide a unique name for the actor and the props. A props is nothing else than a recipe that you give to the actor system telling how you can build actors of this type. And of course, the last one is once you create a, uh, an actor reference through the actor for message, you can, uh, act for, for method, you can send messages using the bang operator. This syntax is copied from the Erlang syntax. So let's come to some more interesting topic. Vertical scalability against horizontal scalability. So most of the time when we talk about scalability, we just think horizontal. I don't know, maybe Google poisoned our mind that we just need to think about horizontal scalability. Definitely is important. But what's the point if I can scale my application over 100 server, and on each one of these I'm using 1% of the core capacity? That's, that's not very effective. So we need to look at the scalability in both dimensions, scale up and scale out. How can we achieve the ability to scale up? So when we talk about actors, we should understand something clearly. Actors are not threads. When I said before it's a single unit of execution, I didn't mean it's a thread. Both are limited resources. You don't have infinite actors, like you don't have infinite threads. But for sure, you have many more actors than threads. 
So they are much more cheaper to be instantiated and much more cheaper to be used. An actor essentially is stealing a thread, borrow, taking a thread to perform some execution. And the important things you have to do when you implement actors, nev never and ever performing blocking operation. This is very naive and uh, obvious uh, aspect. But maybe we don't understand how important this is when we don't figure out with numbers. So on this table, which actually I got inspiration from the reactive programming course by Eric Meyers, there is some statistics about how long does it take to perform different operations. So on your computer, to perform a basic instruction, uh, your processor take one nanosecond. Then if you need to get some information and you are lucky and it is, it is in the L1 level of your cache, then it's going to take 0 0.5 nanosecond to go and get this information. Things get more complicated when we want to go to the main memory, 100 nanoseconds, and down to the last one. When we want to send a package, we are from in Europe, we want to send a package in USA and back, and it's going to take 150 milliseconds, which apparently doesn't sound too bad. It's just 150 million nanoseconds. What would you think this is? So you can even think, you know what, I can even block the thread. I can do a blocking operation and know that the thread is going to be blocked because it's going to be just 150 milliseconds. We never think that we can perform operation at the rate of one nanosecond. So let's think in human terms. Let's take a person which is very good in perform a certain type of operation and is so skilled that whatever task you give him, he's going to go, he's gonna do in one second. Now, would you like to tell to your thread to stop for five years? before to get the next operation. So now we start to figure out how the 150 millisecond wait in this, from this table. Okay, but we are talking about distribu distributed systems. So far we were talking about concurrency. We still have to cover distribution and mobility. So now comes horizontal scalability. And horizontal scalability in a, an actor model means allow your actor system to be deployed across multiple nodes. And this is where we empower the referential transparency. Remember the property that I don't need to know what the actor is running right now. I just need a way to communicate with that one. So how ACA is organized? So far we were talking about ACA core, the bottom layer, which give us the primitives operation that allows our actor to talk to each other. And this is how we implement the concurrency. On top of this, there is ACA.io, which is the set of primitive network operations that actor can perform, and this has to be by nature asynchronous. ACA remote. This introduced the concept of routers, how we can send messages to actors that are in different nodes. And this is the distribution aspect of the distributed system. And we come to the cluster. Cluster has more responsibility, has to think about failure, be fault tolerant, so we need to have a mechanism to have failure detection, need to understand convergence, make sure that all the nodes are in the same state or ha have the same view of the situation and there is some leadership going on. On top of the ACA cluster, we can implement different design patterns for distributed system, like Singleton, when you need just one actor across all your system, sharding, and have a way to distribute things, and publishing and subscribe, and so more. So, ACA cluster. A cluster has to deal with nodes, logical members of a cluster. A node is identified by a unique ID, which is a tuple of host name, port, and UID. Usually the UID is the actor system name. A cluster is a set of nodes joined together by a membership relationship. And inside this cluster, there is always one member that has to play the, the role of leader. This is not a strong role. It's not assigned uniquely to an entity. Every single node can take over and become the leader. The responsibility of the leader is make sure that every single node has the same knowledge or make sure that they have the same knowledge and actually perform joining or exiting operation of the membership of a cluster. In ACA, a cluster communicates through a protocol called the Gossip Protocol. This is highly inspired by the Dynamo paper. The idea is that I want a decentralized protocol for system to communicate each other. And the pro uh, property of a Gossip Protocol is to be probabilistic, but most of all viral, and actually can get to a convergent point. Fail detection. So we said we need to be fault tolerant. We need to know that a node might have problem, identify, and actually exclude from the cluster. And we also don't want to have sick nodes, part of the system that is not behaving at the full health. Maybe it's better that to shut the door to them and having a healthy system to don't affect the responsiveness. So let's talk about the Gossip protocol. 
The way it works is that every single node has a knowledge about the cluster. So every single node has a state which can be represented by this case class gossip. Every node knows all the members of the cluster. He knows all the members which he talked directly, so he has seen, the one which are unreachable, and the vector clock. Unfortunately, I won't have enough time to talk about the vector clock. Uh, it's important to mention that this comes from the uh, Lamport timestamp, but the concept here is a way for me to version, to have a partial order of, the, um, of, of, my, of my state. So a node 5, for example, going to send a message to a node 2 sharing his gossip. And gossip is all about, tell me what you know, I'm going to tell what I have. So if someone else tell me something, which contains more the information than what I have, I'm going to merge with mine. I'm going to increment the version on the vector clock, and I'm going to start to gossip with other nodes. And from a probabilistic point of view, and with some adjustment, I can bring this to a converged point where all the nodes are going to share the same status. And when a cluster is sharing the same status, then the nodes, they don't need to communicate each other the gossip because you don't want to transfer too many data over the network. So they just start to share the vector clock. If the vector clock version changed, then probably we need to start again the gossip exchange. A cluster contains status. A node can be joining, can be up and active in the cluster, contributing, can decide to leave, and can go in the exiting stage. There are other status, but these are the main active. The up and the exiting status are decided by the leader. So we know that in the cluster there is a leader which is going to decide if one node from joining can go up or from leaving can exit. And the leader will allow this only when all the node has reached the convergence. So they keep gossiping. When the, uh, when the leader is going to see that all the vector clocks version of the, all the nodes has converged, then he can perform an action because the cluster is unhealthy status. The last point is the failure detection. And this is a very complicated topic because there is not a good, uh, an exact way to identify if a node is down you, you might, there is not 100% guarantee to know if the node that is not responding is effectively not, uh, down. It can be a network failure, the network can be slow, effectively the node is down or is overloaded, some garbage collect uh, collection is going on. And there are some paper about the impossibility of what you can do in a distributed system. And if you have attended the presentation from Alvaro, then you have a good understanding of all the problematic here. It's worth to mention that ACA used the acral failure detector, which rather than tell you ex if a node is, uh, is up or down, gonna use a statistical approach and give you a fee coefficient, which is nothing else, the likelihood that this node is down or not. And this is performed not by one entity, but the node inspect themselves and take this decision. So the last part is how to configure an ACA cluster. The easiest way is using the type safe config file, but all these properties can be passed to the um, virtual machines. So the first one is the ACA actor provider, which allows the system now to be able to identify uh, an actor not just inside a specific VM, but all over the cluster. The second one are the configuration for your node to communicate with the other node. So which port and which host name I should use in order to start gossiping with the other node and implement the clustering. And then we have the seed nodes. So when, when a node join, join a cluster, which are the first entity which I should start to gossip with? Of course, I can always derivate a cluster from an actor systems, and through a cluster instance, I can subscribe for a specific event. So I can actually create an actor that can listen another member, another node join the cluster, a node abandon the cluster, a node become unresponsive. And these information are very good when you want to implement different design patterns, which I won't be able to give you an overview in this design and this flash talk, but you can think about the singleton pattern, the sharding regions, sub publishing a subscribe. And uh, that's pretty much all. Uh, just last word, we are hiring in William Hill. And uh, now time for questions and answers. Any questions? Any monadic questions to respond in the future? <laughs> okay. Okay, guys, thank you very much.